everybody. Welcome to Lacrosse Now. That is Travis Eldridge. I am Tom Eschen. Thank you for joining us as we get you ready for another weekend of lacrosse, the final weekend of February lacrosse yeah. here in 2022. But we did have some things go on during the week that we're going to talk about. We've got a couple guests. It's going to be a good show. Yeah, we've got uh, Vanderbilt head coach Beth Hewitt joining us. A big win for the Commodores. They knocked off Nor uh, Notre Dame over the weekend. They've got a couple of big games coming up. Had some fun with her, including talking uh, country music. Obviously, yeah. she's in Nashville. And Ronan Jacoby coming off that big game for him at Rutgers. We talk about what it's like to transfer from Division Three. He, he played at Wesleyan, won a national championship there. Now finishing up his grad year at Rutgers. But we start with the breaking news in the NLL. And that's that commissioner, Nick Sikevich, is stepping down from his post as commissioner. He says uh, leaving to look at other opportunities in the international uh, sports realm. But it means that Jessica Berman is now the interim commissioner for now as they look for a replacement. Yeah, surprise, I think, is the biggest thing that came out of this. Middle of the season, of course, we just talked to him um, at the beginning of this yeah. podcast back in the fall. Um, and, and he had obviously a vision for what he wanted to do and accomplish here at post-pandemic after the league wasn't around for two years or better part of a year and a half. And, yeah. um, you, you know, obviously he's he's really been a part of a big proponent of growth in the league. And we have seen that come to fruition these past few years, both in the States um, and from West to East as well. I mean, you have to look at what he where this league was six years ago when he took over. They were uh, moving teams around, trying to figure out what was next. They, they didn't really have a, any type of uh, media deal in terms of where they were going there and since he's taken over he's gotten them two different media deals of course the ESPN deal with the linear opportunities has been a, a nice boost same thing with TSN up in Canada and they've expanded and they've not only expanded but they've brought in big names in terms of investors and owners into this league that have deep pockets that have given this league an opportunity, it feels like, to succeed long term. That is, those are all reasons that this is so surprising happening now, especially after he helped lead them through the pandemic yeah. where they didn't have games and kept all the owners in check and kept this, this league in order so that they could pick up kind of where they left off back in 2020. One thing I will say is we talked to him a few times during the pandemic, and they had an outstanding attitude with his leadership through the whole thing from uh, the outside, I guess. We can't attest to what was happening on the inside, but for their approach, at least outwardly, was a very positive one and in terms of yeah we're sticking around we're going to get tracing these we're going to add teams even in the midst of all of this um, and, and take a really positive turn on it even without having lacrosse for about a year and a half yeah for sure uh, earlier this week we had a chance to catch up with NLL insider Jake Elliott for more on this topic here's Jake and we're joined by Jake Elliott now. You know him from, of course, the Lacrosse Classified podcast, the Warriors in Vancouver. Jake, uh, appreciate you coming on with us here today just to give us uh, your initial reaction to the Nick Stakevich, uh moving on from the NLL. Yeah, good to be. I got the best of both worlds here. I got TG and Tom uh, <laughs> in my face here. So uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, you know what? I wasn't all that surprised because I kind of had heard whispers about six months ago that this potentially could be happening. I didn't really want to believe it to be true, but the person that kind of fed me that information has never steered me wrong. So I kind of had to think it was going to happen. And, mm -hmm. you know, almost to the day, uh, it's been about six months since he told me that. So uh, not all that shocked, but I know people from the outside looking in probably are like, what the hell is going on? Because, you know, we're in the middle of a season and all the good things that have been done here with the National Lacrosse League uh, with Nick Sakevich at the helm is a little bit shocking. So I think the main thing here, guys, is that the reason the timing right now is that Nick's contract was up and they're starting to plan for their physical year teams, I mean, the league, I mean, um, which comes up at the end of the month, I believe. So they're kind of planning their next year's budget. And Nick was part of that budget. And that is kind of part of the reason I think Nick is moving on. And I think Nick also feels pretty good about how he was leaving things here at the National Lacrosse League and wants to go on and, and try and do other things in his career as well. When you look at Nick and, and all he accomplished, and obviously this league has expanded in, in great ways since he took over. Uh, they've gone through a couple of different television deals. What's your lasting takeaway about what he did with this league? 
Well, I think he took it to another level for sure, right? Uh, with with the expansion and and some of the you know newer expansion teams still have to kind of get their feet on the ground and and get some solid ground underneath them. But I think that'll happen. But the big one is is ESPN and, and TSN up here in Canada, guys, to have the national TV deal in place for the next number of years is something that this league needed for a long, long time. And Nick and his group were able to get that done and were secured in that. And I just think the overall professionalism look of the league from, from the outside looking in has gone up a, a significant amount. So, you know, there, there was a lot of talk that this league wasn't going to survive five, six years ago. Some teams were going to contract five, six years ago. And that all changed. We've added teams. We added, uh, you know, a really significant TV contract. And I think we're on real stable footing now. And I know Nick had really big plans to kind of to move the league up to a 30 team league in the next decade or so. For me, I think we're real close to where we need to be. One more team in the West, balance things out, eight and eight, 16, six, you know, 16 teams have two uh, conferences, four divisions, and then just sit on that for the next five years and let everybody get stability. 16 teams is legit, you know, and if I think if we can have some really good balance there, we're going to be in a really good spot. So, None of this happens without Nick, so I want to thank him for all his work, and I wish him the best of luck uh, with whatever future endeavors he moves on to do. Yeah, speaking of the future, Jake, I mean, what type of person from what part of the sports world do you think is best to sort of pick up where he left off? Yeah, well, you know, uh, Jessica Berman, the, the deputy commissioner, will move into Nick's role here for the time being. And I think it's kind of her job to either keep or lose, depending on the job that she does or what she wants to do. And and I think Jessica, since coming into the league, has put her footprint and in, in impact on, on this league as well with some of the things that she has done. And I look forward to, to having her at the top. I think it's a really unique situation to have a female as the commissioner of a pro sports league i don't think it's ever been done i know she was the first deputy commissioner so i have to believe she is the first full-time commissioner of any professional sports league and uh, jessica is very passionate about a lot of things including the sport of lacrosse so i'm excited to see what she brings to the table in, in a leadership role in that regard but i think there will be some due diligence by the board of governors and the owners of the national lacrosse league to kind of turn some stones over and and see if there is uh, some other candidates that may be suitable for the job i just want to follow up on, on nick leaving here one more question for you here jake because I, I think it's interesting he's done so much good and there's been a lot of great press but obviously the owners and the board of governors decided that it's someone else's job to take them to the next step was there anything in your feeling about this situation of of maybe a disconnect between where nick as the commissioner wanted to go and, and where maybe some of the owners and the people making these decisions decide the league wants to go instead if if i had to i don't have any inside knowledge on that guys so i'll just make that very yeah. clear right off the top but if i had to venture a guess in that regard i would say that the plans to keep the expansion train rolling to where he nit nick wanted to take things and in the time frame that he wanted to take them I think made a lot of people nervous. We saw this kind of happen to the league over a decade ago where they got up to 13 teams and then the next year they were down to nine and then down to seven. And so nobody wants to see that happen again. And and Nick was very bullish on expansion and, and getting the league up to 30 teams. And, and like I said, I think we only need one more team to get to 16 and then we need to sit and rest on that a little bit and go with that for, for four or five, six years, and, and then maybe look at expansion again, drive that demand up um, with outside interest in, from parties. So if I had to venture a guess, I would say that might be one of the biggest concerns that the board had is that expansion was happening a little too quickly. Mm, yeah. Always good stuff, Jake. Appreciate uh, your insight, as we always do, and the time you took to, to speak with us today. So thanks once yeah, again no for coming worries. on. Sorry, I couldn't like put on a nice shirt and shave and stuff <laughs> for you guys there. But uh, I'm glad to be back with you. I always enjoy coming on LSN and, and chatting lacrosse with you guys. So 
you got my content uh, anytime here, fellas. Let's pick it up. Like maybe like a weekly, uh, weekly hit we can do here as I shake my phone around. We'll, we'll get you back on. We'll te- next time we'll talk more about your Warriors because the Warriors are on a roll. Well, hey, Travis, uh, I don't. I know you just sold the Warriors, <laughs> so you better. You might want to like uh, change your thinking on that and, and recoup and, and reinvest because uh, by the time that you might want to do that again. You might be priced out, brother, so <laughs> true. Uh, think about that. Think about that. I, I will certainly <laughs> think about that. We may have to revisit stock options next week. Jake, appreciate the time, man. Thanks. Cheers, boys. Have a good one. Thanks, Jake. Always great talking to Jake. Of course, you want to hear more of his takes and, and all of that stuff. Uh, Lacrosse Classified is where a lot of that is. A lot yeah. of great, he has all the connections. He's got a lot of great guests. And so once you're done listening to our podcast, you can listen to his. For sure. Yeah. Let's move to the college game now. Let's look ahead to this weekend. But first... We look back for our midweek moment from the last couple of days. We had a lot of games and uh, some, some interesting stuff happened. What's your midweek moment? I'm going uh, to the women's side here. Loyola women beating Towson 13 to 11. This game was fun. It was electric. The guy, the kid doing play-by-play or the man, whoever it might have been, really made it very exciting. It was into every every single goal felt like you were going to win a national championship. It was a lot of fun. Very dramatic. It was very – but it, it, it was for a good reason. I mean, Loyola led 6-1 after the first. Towson then outscored them 4-1 at, in the, after the second. So it was 7-5 Loyola at the half, back and forth the rest of the way. Tigers then scored – for the game's final goals to make it 13 to 11 the final. So this was a lot of fun. Got a lot of good action out there. Uh, Sydney Black, sophomore attacker from Cincinnati, Ohio. Three goals, two assists. She had a career high on the day. So Loyola, you know, they, they seem to be getting a bit more into form as the season goes on. Really pounded Johns Hopkins to start yeah. their year. And Towson 0 and 2. That's a tough game for you to win, but I think they learned a lot about themselves, and, and we learned about a, a lot about Towson in that game too. Tigers once again have a really difficult schedule. This is one. <laughs> Oh, they, they got Michigan again coming up here shortly. Good um, freshman, Milana Zizakovic from Alberta, Canada. Mm. She had a hat trick. So watch out. Towson uh, and Sonia LaMonica always continue to, to bring through stars, and they seem to be around every single year. My favorite part from that game was the fact that at the end of the first half, both of us, when hearing the commentary, asked if it was the end of the game. But it was not. But great drama. There was drama. In there was that, a lot yeah. of drama at the end of the first half. It was fun. Uh, my midweek moment, a huge shout-out to Lafayette because they at home beat Drexel 13 to 11, which is very different to what happened last year. We did the Lafayette Drexel game here last year. It was at Drexel in Philadelphia. So different place, but Drexel won that game 24 to eight. Lafayette was 0 and 11 last season. They already have two wins. They've won two of their first three. They're two and one. Their entire starting attack unit last year was all freshmen. So a year later, and now they're producing. In this game alone, they combined for six goals and three assists. Peter Lehman, Charlie Cunoff, and uh, Kalen uh, Cram, uh, Colin Cram, the three of them are going to grow up together. Like the three of them came in, all started as true freshmen. Now they're sophomores, and they are producing. They're stepping up. Gabe Cummins, they just threw in another freshman in goal. So <laughs> you got a brand-new starting goalie back there. But he made 11 saves. The work that Pat Myers has done, because he got to this program and knew, all right, we've got to build this thing from the ground up. And yep. it's been hard. And I give him a lot of credit because – this has not been easy. It's not easy to go an entire season without winning a game. But he's figuring out a way with a lot of youth and just putting some trust in this freshman, in this now sophomore class, some of the freshmen stepping in and letting them kind of grow up. And we're seeing it before our eyes what this team could become. And I don't know. You, you give this team now this year a little bit more competitive, another year under their belt. By by the time that they're seniors, I would not be surprised if they're competing for Patriot League tournament spots and Patriot League championships. Well, you, you see that's how a program grows, and you get a, a good class together with uh, it's a good recruiting class to start, and then you play together. You might have to take some lumps, but then you play together for a few years, and you have that moment as maybe that senior year, you know, when you have all the veterans coming back and you're able to put something on the board, right? Yeah. You're able to say, okay, this is the year we can look back at. This is the year we did it right. No matter what happens after that, you can always look back at that was sort of your guideline to the, the way to get things done. And this could be, like you said, coming together and already doing it here in their sophomore season. Experience that success now at this point, so important too. Yeah, exactly. Especially because they, they took so many lumps when they're young, it's easy for that them to get down. So I, I give credit 
credit to Pat Myers, too, for yeah. making sure, building this team up, saying, okay, hey, guys, we can do this. We can turn this around, and now they're getting wins. Yep. All right, let's go to categories, Yes. Um, as we often do here for this on weekend. Thursday for this weekend. Came up with four of them. We start with Lock of the Week. Just feels like you have to say it like that. Lock of the Week, Travis. So we looked at some DraftKings lines, you know, us and our betting and gambling, <laughs> if you will. Um, not that we do any of that, it's just for fun. Right. We yeah. looked at some DraftKings lines for this week, and there was a couple that stuck out to us. What's your Lock of the Week? So in the ACC, Syracuse and Virginia, huge game. For, for both these programs, both in the top 10. You know what the line is for this on DraftKings? Tell me. Virginia has th is a three-and-a-half goal favorite. So I am hammering oh, Syracuse plus three-and-a-half. Hammering oh, it. This, wow. is, this is as hammering much of a it. gimme as you can possibly get in anything. First of all, Okay. Syracuse won both meetings last year. So that's one. Both these programs, uh, changes, but similar rosters to what they had a year ago. Syracuse won both games. Remember, Virginia was 2-4 and four in the ACC last season, despite the fact that they won the national championship. So it gives you an idea of just what it's like to go through the gauntlet of this league. Remember, there's, unlike some of the other leagues, they're playing the same exact number of games they did last year. They added the couple of ACC matchups this season uh, like they did a season ago. Number two. Five of the last seven games between these two programs <laughs> have been decided by yeah. one goal. 17 of the 38 meetings, more than half the times that these two teams play, it is a one-goal game. So chances are, if you play the statistics, it's probably going to be a close game, at least within three and a half goals. Right. Oh, absolutely. That's the thing for me. These teams always play close games. Right. I don't care where anybody is doesn't in the matter. rankings. It doesn't matter. Like you say, you look at last year and where these teams were last year, and it still didn't make sense. So right. that they're going to play a close game no matter what. Number three. I've oh, got three oh, reasons okay. for you. Jacob Fopp at the face-off X. You know what he did against Petey LaSala last year? What did he do against Petey LaSalle last was, year? Petey LaSalle was one of the great face-off guys in, in, the, in college lacrosse last year. Yeah. Jacob Fopp went 46 of 60 in two games against Petey LaSalle last year. Dominated against Virginia. Both of those guys are back. I wouldn't be surprised if Virginia maybe throws in um, a couple of other different looks at Jacob Fopp, just considering what the track record is there from last year. But those are three reasons why there is 0% chance that Syracuse loses by more than three and a half goals. I, I think you stated it all. I, I agree. I, I just there, think there's that, just no no I mean, way. I, you, you give me the stats. I just look at what I've seen from them over the <laughs> right. past few years. It's it, like, this rivalry is one of those. You, even, you throw it out. You, you see throw it, out the record time and time again. You see one of these teams with a four goal leading their fourth. Like that's not going to last. No, someone's going to rattle off a five goal run and, and come back and win in overtime. Yeah, so for sure. Nonetheless, what's your what's your lock, of the, lock week? of the week goes to. Yale, Penn State is what we're looking at here. And this was an intriguing one. Yale is a five and a half goal favorite That's on DraftKings here. And I know Penn State has had a very slow start. I, I realize that. But at the same time, it does. They have a very young team. They're, they're moving on from what they had a great core for years. But they're going to come together. I mean, Jeff Tambroni knows how to recruit. He knows who to bring in there. You already have a Will Peden who's made in that image and likeness of Grant Day Met, a feeder in that offense with Jack Trainer, the one that's scoring the goals. Peden as a freshman, five goals, ten assists so far this yep. year. So I know they've come off to a really slow start. It just doesn't feel like Yale in their second game is going to go there and, and blow out Penn State in this spot. It doesn't feel like that's what's going to happen. And we talked Tuesday at length about the Ivy League. I was very, you know, saying, you know, it's not going to take as long as everybody thinks for them to get acclimated back to a regular schedule yeah. again. But I looked deeper into the Villanova game. It was a very big game of runs. And it feels like maybe that is the thing that will hold back maybe some of these Ivy League teams from dominating is that it's not going to be as consistent as maybe we're used to from them over four quarters. They're going to have good stretches, and then they'll have some maybe rusty, bumpy stretches is yeah. what I'm feeling. Because against Villanova, Yale outscored Villanova 9-1 to in the third. And then Villanova in the fourth outscored Yale five to one. We call game it a game was wild. We call it a game of runs all the time, but I feel like that's going to be even more true for a lot of these Ivy League teams yeah. this year. So I feel like Penn State maybe can take advantage of that. A well-coached squad, uh, a squad nothing to lose. I mean, I no, guess, they definitely you, you don't. You know what I mean? At this point, now. I mean no yeah. one's really expecting much from them. So I, I like. Penn State to make this close against you. I don't think they're going to win, but I don't think it's going to be a five and a half goal game. 
Yeah, I mean, to beat somebody by six goals is a that's a yeah. big win. Like that, you, that is a dominant win. So I I probably I agree with if you. If that happens, Yale should be number one in the country. Now, yeah. If you beat go out and beat Penn State by I, eight goals, yeah. I also think Villanova. Yeah. You got a common opponent between the two. Penn State played Villanova tough, and I I mean yeah, thirteen yeah, twelve. Yeah, and yeah. Villanova played Yale tough. I I don't I don't think that five and a half is a big separation yeah. but it's jumping on the fact that Penn State has struggled this year coming off a loss to St. Joe's yeah. Nindy Lions need something they need something positive before the Big Ten slate because as we're finding out about the Big Ten it's going to be a gauntlet it's gonna be fun this year yeah so <laughs> it was a gauntlet last year I mean Penn, you're Penn State right now you're looking like you're possibly the sixth best team in the league you're in last place with what Michigan has shown early on and that potent offense like Penn State's got some work to do yeah um, and we'll see some of that, I think, come to fruition this weekend. Okay. So I think at the end of February, they're going to start to get going here at the very least. All right. Uh, let's go to our blow-up spot. Who is blowing up this weekend? What player is showing up? So catchy today I know. With, with these terms. Um, I've got Joey Epstein against North Carolina this week. And I know, it's like, a big game. It's an interesting game for Johns Hopkins and UNC because it feels like Maybe Johns Hopkins has overperformed expectations to start the season, and North Carolina has done the opposite of that. I know they just beat Brown, but that was a close game, and North Carolina hasn't been the same team as we're used to. Hopkins with wins over Jacksonville. Towson, and we know Towson has Kobe Smith in that back end. Loyola with Cam Wire. So I'm looking, obviously, at the defenses here and what Joey Epstein can do. He had six goals against Towson. He yeah. had two goals, three assists against Loyola. Yeah, he had two goals against Georgetown, too. So it's not like he's been out there and, and not producing because he's gotten the job done every single week. I think, like I've said before in this program, feels like he's got something to prove this year after coming in as such a big recruit. And you could feel that chip on his shoulder when we talked to him a couple weeks ago as well. UNC giving up 12.6 goals per game this year. Ohio State scored 20 on them. No more Will Bowen back there. Need I say more? It just feels yeah. like this is, all, this be it. A, is a, a, a point where – Johns Hopkins and Joey Epstein are going to have their way a bit with this North Carolina defense. Well, I think it was interesting. You look back at the Towson game, and it was almost like you added more chip to Joey Epstein's shoulder because Kobe Smith wasn't guarding him. They had Kobe Smith on Connor D. Simone because it was the Tigers scouted it and said, hey, we don't, we're don't. we more worried about him than Joey. Yeah. And if you're Joey, you go, wait, hold up, what? Yeah. And so it, I think that also adds to a dynamic for Hopkins that – you do have two guys that can take on that number one defender, and then you let the other guy who doesn't get that number one take over. So if you know if North Carolina decides, all right, we're going to try to take Connor D. Simone out with our number one guy, then Epstein can go off exactly what he did in the second quarter when he scored what five straight goals. He had yeah, that's right, Made natural that long hat run. trick yeah. Yeah. against Towson. I mean, almost a went, natural sock trick. Yeah, don't. Don't let Joey Epstein get hot because it's it's over when when that happens. Blow up spot. Uh, my blow-up spot, I'm going back to the Ivy League here. Sam Hanley for Penn. I think that he has an opportunity to go off here against Duke. This is a, another br- just interesting, huge game for Penn early on. You take on Georgetown right away, play them in a tough game. Now they're going to Long Island to take on Duke. Sam Hanley with a goal and two assists in a season opener. So a decent day for, for the midfielder. But I think we're getting more here against Duke and here's why I don't know if Penn wins but I have a feeling this is going to be a much different game than Penn played against Georgetown yes like, oh, Georgetown yeah. <laughs> Penn was a methodical was. slugfest <laughs> I get the feeling that with the athletes we're going to have on the field between Penn and Duke a neutral site game on Long Island it's supposed to be a great atmosphere I think they're going to sell out of the 3,000 tickets they're going to sell I get the feeling that this is going to be like a 17-15 type back and forth game, which is exactly why I think Sam Hanley has the opportunity to go off. You made the mention of this for the Duke defense. As good as the players are back there, you lose Cade Van Rappors from a couple of seasons ago and then JT Giles Harris from last year. You're losing two of the best defensemen we've seen in the college game in the last five years. And so, look, there's just naturally going to be a bit of a letdown. They're giving up 10 goals a game, Duke is. They gave up 14 earlier this week against Delaware. Now, I know some of those happened when Duke was in control of the game and they start doing some different things. But with this Duke offense, they're going to go. And they should because they've got athletes through the roof. They can roll out seven, eight, nine, ten guys that can come out of the box and beat their man and score. So the offense playing that way also means the defense is going to have to 
step up even more. They're going to have more pressure on them going the other way. I just think that leads to a little bit more back and forth game. I think Sam Hanley can take advantage of that and uh, and score a little bit more here today. Yeah, and Penn this weekend. And, and Penn competed with Georgetown. They did, and and of course, which the first game back for an Ivy League team in two years, and Georgetown this. What a lot of people think is a Final Four team, and, and Ben right out there, Sam Manley, like it. I think Sam Manley assisted on the first two goals of that game, and Georgetown got some of the momentum, but it was still a close game. It was a battle, and an ugly battle at that. And I think we're going to figure out what Penn's identity here is pretty quickly because it's either that they're going to have some maybe ugly games that are one or two goals, or can you route up and down with a team like Duke with Hanley, you know, running the show there a bit. And I think it, at times, especially early in the season, it's a lot harder to play a team like Georgetown that's going to create that kind of slugfest than it is to play a team like Duke where you maybe get up and down to more because there's more possessions. There's more chances yeah. to get a feel for the game. That Walking into that Georgetown game, that's tough because you know possessions may be limited. You're going up against really stout uh, defenders in terms of some of their close defensemen for Georgetown, some of the best, including best goalie maybe in the country. It's not like yeah. if you you're if you're not efficient with those shots and hitting them, it's a long day. So I think they have a chance to maybe get a little bit more of a rhythm here this weekend. Yeah, I like that's going to be a fun game. Uh, Saturday Very fun. at noon yeah. there. All right, next one. Who needs to show up? I'm going to go to the ACC for this one. Speaking of Georgetown. Notre Dame versus Georgetown here this weekend. This game is huge, I think, especially for the ACC because the ACC has had a kind of rough start to the year. Virginia has looked fine, but they had the one-goal game against High Point. Even without a couple of guys against Towson, let the Tigers jump out to an early start. And Duke lose. North Carolina's lost. Syracuse lost to Maryland. So ACC needs somebody to go out there and, and win a big game. And I think the the spot here for Notre Dame is for their offense against Georgetown. This is they scored 20 plus goals against Detroit Mercy in the opener, blew them out as they're supposed to. But here's the here's the real test. Can can this offense score against maybe one of the best defensive units and best back ends in the entire country in Georgetown? All the all the guys we just mentioned, Pat and Chris Cavanaugh, Chris obviously joining his brother in the starting attack <laughs> unit. The Cavanaugh's need to go off and this midfield unit has to go off because you know when you've got Will Bowen and Gibson Smith as the close guys, like they're going to take some guys out. So can the midfielders beat their matches? I'm looking at Quinn McCann, Wheaton Jackaboys, Eric Dobson. These guys need to go. Georgetown's only given up eight goals per game against Hopkins and Penn, so they're not doing this against nobodies. Notre Dame has to get over 10 to win this game. And the mm. question for me is, I think Notre Dame's defense can hold Georgetown. Can their offense get over 10 and win it. Has Georgetown, for you, proven some of their worth so far? Have they lived up to yeah. our expect the expectations as a collective whole here? I, both of the games that they've played so far are games that I think Georgetown teams in the past with some of the expectations they would have would have lost mm -hmm. one of them. Yeah, because like, they have a tough schedule. Yeah, like that, Hop that Hopkins game was the perfect example. Hopkins had played a couple of games already. It was a Sunday. Hopkins had like a feel. They were coming off a big energy-boosting win, and Georgetown hadn't played a game yet. It would have been really easy for them to lose that game, and instead they put the pedal down on the metal and blew them out in the second half. And then going to Penn the second week of the season when Penn is just like they – or like so much yeah <laughs> they wanted to play cannon. so bad <laughs> yeah and that would have been an easy game to lose on the road but they're finding ways to win and I to find ways to win early in the year I think is really important another test on Saturday great right. game so, what's your who needs to show up for you Loyola it's time I'm not gonna say now or never yet we'll probably have a now or never category down the road <laughs> at some point here but Loyola against Rutgers it is time for Loyola to show up you have a 20 to 8 loss to Maryland you lose the Johns Hopkins and you got these guys. I, I was all high on Loyola before the year. I thought they've got a good veteran group. They've been there. That They've seen everything. That They've had this, these experiences in big games. They just haven't gotten the job done. Aiden Olmstead, one goal on 16 shots this year. He does have six assists, but that's not very efficient offensively. You've got Kevin Lindley, three goals in two games. Bailey Savio, 44% faceoffs. He's been over 50% since his freshman year. This is their opportunity to go out there and show up. And they have to show up against Rutgers, who are 
top five in the nation right now somehow. Coming off a big win. They've, they've played a bunch of games, and Loyola, they've played a couple of tough opponents. Yeah. So you have to go out now and show up against a team in Rutgers who I think they can beat. And I think Rutgers is a beatable team and hasn't really proven much yet. They've, yeah, they beat Army. They've done what they've needed to do, but now in terms of Loyola, now is the time for these guys to show up. Not now or never yet, because they do peak later in the season generally. We talked about saw this it last year. We saw it before. But, yeah, let's let's get going here and do it now against a top-five team and, and sort of get yourself back in the conversation. Now is the time to do that. Yeah, I expected a little bit, and they, they were better against Hopkins than they were yeah. against Maryland. But this is this is the type of game where, okay, we shake off the tough early season and we show yeah, people. They, they Maryland why. looked like a PLL team. It's true, they did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they need, they need to show people why there were – people voting him in the top 10 in the country in the preseason. Right. Because they have the talent. We saw it last year. They have the talent to do it. Now you got to play like it. Yeah. And so now is the time for Loyal to show up, in my opinion. All right. Uh, let's go under the radar. What's your under the radar game to watch this week? I mean, things are going great right now in Providence. Basketball team just got a triple overtime win Electric. last night. The roof was leaking, but we kept on playing on. So Playing Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift was wild. I'm, I'm riding the Friars. I'm just kidding. But this is, this is the game. They're playing St. Joe's. And both these teams, two and one. And uh, Providence has a couple of okay wins over Holy Cross. They beat Siena as well. Ryan Bell, nine goals, four assists this year. And, and St. Joe's have a little bit better resume, I guess, to this point. They beat St. Bonaventure and they beat Penn State. That was that big win over Penn State, 15-13. And it's going to be really interesting early on for both these teams because yeah. you sort of get a good tone of your season set early on here in the month of February. It's either you fall in the two and two, you go to three and one with a couple of nice wins. And you've got a lot of confidence going into the month of March as you near the conference play. St. Joe's, Zach Cole has been great at the faceoff act. 70%. Providence has three different guys they are going to throw at him um, tomorrow or on Saturday, excuse me. Matt Bomer for St. Joe's, 11 goals, five assists this year. It's going to be a fun game, I feel like. A competitive one at that, and one that might be have a little bit riding on, I think, for both these teams moving forward. I really like the Hawks. They're coming yeah. off that win over Penn State. They're my team to watch. They're a team that, to me, is in that top 20 conversation. They're right outside my poll. I keep an eye on St. Joe's. In, Do they uh, get in with a win NAC. here, Travis? Do they get in it depends to your on, poll? It depends on what happens the oh, rest okay. of the year. A win over Providence isn't going to, That's you know, a nice, the three and one. Nice, yeah, it would yeah. be a nice win, but... you. Like Hobart got into the poll, but they beat Lehigh. And I had high expectations for Lehigh. That's, that's what it takes. Uh, for me, my under-the-radar game, going out west, Jacksonville, obviously Ooh. they've kind of been the darlings of Talk the 2022 the season. Another tough test. They go out to Denver to take on the Pioneers. This Dolphins team might. This is an opportunity not only to say, okay, we had a great win over Duke, but they followed it up with a win over Marquette. And they win yeah. against another Big East team. You add a win on the road at Denver. All of a sudden, this Jacksonville team is no longer just talking about, oh, this is a really nice story earlier in the season, and they're going to be competing for a SoCon title. You're talking about a team that like is starting to line up some kind of resume that could get you an at-large bid. The Hopkins loss may, at, I think, at the very beginning of the season, may be the one that would keep you out if you lose a couple of games in the SoCon. But I tell you what, if you line up wins over Denver on the road, wins over Duco on the road, a win over Marquette with what they have the rest of the way, they play St. John's, another Big East team later in the season, and you end up losing in the SoCon title to a high point of Richmond who's also got a pretty good resume. I don't know. It's going to be hard to keep the Dolphins out. So this is a big game. I'm very interested in that. Uh, Max Walbaum averaging over five points per game. He has been just terrific for the Dolphins so far uh, as the transfer from Tufts. Keep an eye on this Dolphins team. I'm really intrigued to see from this. Also, the Denver side. Oh, that's what I was going to say. I the am Denver, really, you gotta they, they got get going here. blown out. They lost by nine goals at Duke. That's always a tough trip to make. But I, this is like show up because uh, – they have, it almost feels like, been replaced by Georgetown as the yeah. class of the Big East. It yeah. used to, it felt like until up through last year, it was the two of them always battling. Look, Denver needs to win a couple of these games. I mean, look who's the higher ranked team here. Right. Jacksonville's 13th and Denver 16th. And it's, I looked at that, I'm like, did we do, I'm sorry, guys, did we do that right? I'm like, yeah, we did that right. And I don't even know if you can really make an argument otherwise. No, no, that's what we've both seen. Of what we've seen it's this legit. year. It's yeah, legit. I mean, 
We'll see what happens when they play on the field on Saturday, and we'll go from there, I guess. But, yeah, that's yeah. why it's an under-the-radar game. <laughs> Not is. getting a lot of talk, but yeah. top 20 matchup. Yeah, it is. It's, you're right. And, and between a team in Jacksonville that's ranked higher than Denver, yeah. <laughs> that's under the radar, if anything else. Uh, meanwhile, you go ahead. Uh, we got uh, Ronan Jacoby. Uh, Rutgers, Rutgers, Loyola. Like I said, game. Loyola's got to show up. Ronan Jacoby's got to show up for Rutgers. So we got to catch up with him this week. So we've got Rutgers' Ronan Jacoby joining us now. Ronan, of course, played at Wesleyan for four years, transferring here for another season here with the Scarlet Knights and coming off a big game this past weekend with six goals. Ronan, man, you were feeling it this weekend. How's it feel there in the, the, the new red jerseys for you? I guess the colors aren't too different, but how's <laughs> it feel being at Rutgers? It's good. It's awesome, man. I mean, getting to play like primetime big games, uh, it's a blast. And, you know, as you mentioned, the colors are the same, but – uh, name on the front's a little different, but, you know, it's still a blast to just be able to, to put on the uniform, run out into SHI Stadium. Uh, it's been a pleasure so far. Uh, you know, you might are you a superstitious guy at all? Do you try and do exactly what you did before the Army game, like the rest of the year? Do you, you try to do that again? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of superstitious. Uh, sometimes I like to, like, if I see a superstition coming, like maybe purposely break it, prove to myself that I'm still in control a little bit. Um, but a couple of things stay the same, but, you know, they're usually just small ones like, you know, last shot of warm up has to go in. Um, just small things like that. Nothing, nothing too major. Did you do anything special before this one? Anything different? No. <laughs> no <laughs> I wish. I wish I would have kept it up. But, uh, <laughs> right. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. That means, like you said, you, yeah. you're in control, right? You yeah, just proved yeah, yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. actually really smart because it's, then it starts getting out of control. You're like, I've got to eat the same breakfast, even if we're playing at like 6 o'clock at night. Like, you can really screw yourself up, so that's probably smart. What, <laughs> what's been the biggest transition for you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, starting off in the beginning of the fall, like definitely top to bottom, just athleticism um, was a little bit of a tough transition. Um, but other than that, you know, it hasn't been anything crazy. You know, lacrosse is lacrosse. Uh, just do what I have to do. Um, but, you know, again, in the beginning, it was a little difficult, but I feel that, you know, I was able to get through that sort of learning curve in the fall, which is definitely nice rather than, you know, sort of going through it in the spring. Um, but, you know, being able to play in the NESCAC for four years, like we play some really good teams, you know, tons of guys out there can do it at the division one level. Like you see now with, you know, a bunch of other guys from both the NESCAC, other, uh, top end division three teams are just absolutely killing it this year. Um, and I think it just shows like sort of the balance in the sport. Um, and to me, it's pretty cool uh, to be able to like, you know, I don't want to say like represent division three lacrosse, but like prove that we can do it. And you look at, you know, a bunch of different teams in the nation and they're all doing it as well. Yeah. And then you step into Rutgers, a program that's coming off a historic season. I guess what's the, the, the vibe like walking into a situation like that? Yeah. I mean, I think they've done a great job, both the guys that have been around and the coaches of like, taking what they did last year that worked for them and continuing to implement it, but not, you know, talking about last season, it's not mentioned, you know, certainly, you know, the guys on the team don't think anything is given like no sense of entitlement uh, still have to work, you know, every day, day in, day out to get better um, to ho hopefully, you know, have the same results that we did last year or they did last year. And, you know, ultimately end the season on Memorial day weekend rather than, uh, earlier than that you mentioned the transfers and I think coach Brian Brecht has been one of the best coaches in the country so far at the division one level of figuring out okay we can use the transfer portal a bunch bring in a bunch of guys each year that may fit our needs and then it blends together how is he how have you felt it's been able to blend together with obviously the pieces they have coming back from last year but also some of the guys like you and Mitch Bartolo and some of the other transfers yeah I mean it, it's nothing crazy. It's just, you know, every day we're all going to like just work as hard as we can to just provide results and, and get the team better. And the guys in the locker room did a phenomenal job. I mean, when we walked in on day one, it wasn't like we were new guys. It wasn't like we had to like prove anything or anything like that. Uh, they were really welcoming and, and understanding that, you know, we all came here because we want to win. Um, and also, you know, further our education a little bit as well, um, which, you know, obviously Rutgers has a lot of great master's programs, which makes it even easier for the coaching staff to get guys here in addition to the, you know, the facilities and, and the, uh, you know, lacrosse prowess that we have. But the guys in the locker room is really what, you know, I think makes it work. Um, 
They've been absolutely phenomenal from day one, just welcoming us, you know, getting us up to speed on Rutgers terminology, things that we want to do, how, you know, we handle our business. Um, and it's really just been, you know, I didn't really know what to expect coming in. I didn't know anyone on the team, but it's definitely exceeded my expectations, even though I didn't really have any, uh, you know, and that's, you know, obviously that starts from the top with our coaching staff, but I think it really shows uh, in just the guys that we have in the locker room and, and, you know, just how you know, great of guys they are from top to bottom. We were talking about this the other day. You know, chemistry obviously is a huge part of it. Like you just said, it in acclimating and the terminology, all that. But also, I mean, if you're good, you know, it, everything should take care of itself after that, right? It feels like the talent, also, you're a good lacrosse player. Wherever you go, you should be able to help each other out in some way, I feel like, right? Exactly. And, you know, I don't know all that much about defense, 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 I'll say. Uh, but I know on the, the offensive end, you know, Coach Sarah has done a great job just – testing things out, you know, rolling through different combinations of guys, different offensive schemes. Um, and just, you know, if one thing isn't working, like, all right, that's fine. Like, we'll scrap it, you know, maybe move to the next and just continuing, you know, every day to just tweak little things to just get that chemistry going. Um, and it's really been, you know, it's crazy to think how quickly we've been able to develop that chemistry, which, you know, some teams, you know, struggle with, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a year long thing. And, you know, I feel like, offensively we have pretty good chemistry right now and just hopefully continue to build upon it um week in week out you know i had kind of forgotten i think it's easy to forget that you guys in the nescac in the last couple of years almost dealt with the same thing the ivy leagues yeah. have dealt with where like you didn't have a 2020 really because it was cut short obviously and then 2021 you guys played five games and that, that was it so for you how much did that contribute to wanting to take the opportunity obviously you get a chance to play at division one which is awesome but just having a chance to hopefully complete a full season here to close out a college career. Yeah, I mean, I knew from like the moment that we were given the eligibility back that it was something that I wanted to do. Um, and obviously, you know, in 2020, we thought we were still going to have a 2021 season, which was my senior year. Um, and I knew that I wanted to, to use my fifth year before we found out that we were only going to have an abridged season. Um, but, you know, to me, like it's just made me I'd say like a, a whole lot hungrier and just more thankful for the moments that I have on the field. Like, you know, as you mentioned last year, we only played five games. Um, like half of our team took, you know, the semester off because going into the year, we didn't think we were going to have a season. So they did it to like preserve more eligibility and things like that. So it was really just a chaotic year and, you know, obviously thankful for the four years that I had. And even last year with just a shortened roster, short season, it was a blast, but, you know, it definitely just, you know, I would say like just made me appreciate every moment that I get on the field and practice, but especially games. I mean, we're already four games in, which is, you know, almost what I did or what exact amount of games we had in 2020, one shy of what we had in 2021. So it's certainly just been a blessing just to get to put on the jersey um, and run out there with your buddies. Um, so, you know, to me, that's the biggest thing that it that it's, you know, I don't want to say you've been able to provide, but, you know, that I feel has happened due to it all. I mean, despite not playing a ton, you were still drafted into the NLL last fall uh, by Panther City in the sixth round. Tell us about your box experience and how that maybe has, has helped you out, too, on the other side of things, too. Yeah, I mean, growing up uh, in high school, we had a box league. It was like a bunch of private school teams in the area, and, and it was run out of my town, Glastonbury. So we were able to put a team in, um, and it was, it's been so much fun. Uh, you know, I always really enjoyed it. And this guy, Coach Kirkaldi, um, always was the guy who ran it. Um, and he coached me in club and, and I have a really good relationship with him. And he sort of, you know, was always pressing me of like, you know, I know you can, what a lot of people say is play field inside of a box arena, but if you adapt to this box skill set, it's really just going to help your game tremendously. And to me, you know, in terms of playing field across, it's just made me more comfortable with pressure. Uh, you know, it's okay to have a guy on your hip you know, you're still going to, you know, do whatever you're going to do. Just don't worry about the guy there, play your game. Um, and, you know, certainly made me more comfortable with some contact, uh, which is what I feel has really, you know, been able to help me on in the field sense of it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a blast. I, you know, don't have a ton of experience with box, but, uh, or since high school, I don't have a lot, but, you know, it was always, it was every Sunday uh, and it was the most fun day of the week all the time, just getting in there, like, you know, playing a different game, getting physical um, and struggling to score a little bit, which is always a blast. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, think about it. Like, how much was that on your radar, I guess, of being a pro lacrosse player in the box <laughs> iteration of the, the game? 
Yeah, I mean, throughout my whole time at Wesley, and I honestly like didn't even think that that would be a possibility. Um, and then in the summer, uh, Bob Hamley, who's I believe the GM there, reached out to me and was like, "Hey, like, is this something you would be interested in? You know, you're on our radar. You know, the draft isn't for a little bit, but just sort of want to gauge your interest." And I was like, "Absolutely. Why would I not want to do that? That sounds like an absolute blast." Um, and then the morning of the draft, he, he shot me a text and was like, Hey, like, we think that, you know, if something happens late in the draft, we're going to pick you up. Um, and then he did, I got the call from him and I was jacked up. I mean, definitely not something that I thought was going to happen. Uh, but certainly thankful for the opportunity and, you know, excited to give that a shot, uh, you know, next year in training camp. Did you take the phone call to begin with? Because I'm sure a random number from Texas, you know, those often go, you know, to the wayside. Did you pick up the phone the first time? I actually did. Um, I don't know why, but I did. Um, it wasn't like a car warranty scam or anything right. like yeah. that. It was, a real, it was a real person on the other end of the line. Uh, so, you know, I usually don't pick up random phone calls, but for that reason I did, I guess – I felt it. Some reason yeah. why, right? Yeah. Yeah. Love those, that. Yeah. Those are the times where, like, that's what you always hope for when you get the random call that it's going to be some, like, awesome news that you're not yeah. expecting. It's not usually <laughs> that. So that, that was yeah. a good one. You, you go back to Wesleyan and you have this unique situation where you walk onto campus and you guys win a national championship and you're a contributor as a freshman. I have to think that has to be so hard to then follow up the rest of your lacrosse career now in, in year five of going, you're still chasing after what you had a chance to accomplish freshman year. Like perspective wise, how does that, how do you deal with that knowing like that you, you accomplished the ultimate goal right away. And now you just want more of that the rest of the time you're in college. Yeah. I mean, to me, it was, you know, obviously unbelievable experience that I got to have so early in my career, but it was, you know, I was a freshman. I was like the sixth man on the offense. Um, obviously young, smaller, weaker, um, not as talented. So for me, it's always been, you know, I want to have the ability to, you know, have those moments again where I'm a leader, a key contributor um, and things like that. And also, you know, as much as it stung, I didn't feel like I played my best game in that 2018 national championship game. And I sort of want to like prove to myself that I can do it at the absolute biggest stage, no matter what it is. Um, so that's sort of always been my motivation behind it is both, you know, the opportunity to go back as a leader um, and then additionally, like sort of prove it to myself that, you know, the moment's not too big, anything like that. And, you know, the little taste of glory and, and how great it was definitely is easy to keep you motivated. Um, and, you know, I, I'm definitely, you know, still chasing that dream of doing it again. And I think it'd be pretty cool to have the opportunity to do it at the division three and the division one level. Um, and, you know, here we just got to, you know, get better every day and, and, you know, keep our eyes focused on today. Um, and then hopefully, you know, things will align and we'll be ready to go uh, in May to make a run in the tournament. Yeah, that's a, that's a good perspective. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you obviously were in Connecticut for the majority of your life. Then you go over to New Jersey, not too far away, but like how different, like cuisine wise, is there any like delicacy that you've tried that's New Jersey? I don't even know where to start there. What, where would you, is there a thing that you had to do like when you got there? Uh, so I've actually been in Connecticut my entire life until this year, grew up, uh, you know, always there. So nothing that I had to do, there was no ritual that the state made me do when I came to Rutgers. Uh, but a couple of the, the Jersey guys have had me, you know, get into like pork roll, Taylor ham, egg and cheeses, uh, I'm not going to get into like the debate of what it's called because that's some heated conversations. Um, but that's really the only thing. And then like, obviously, you know, pizza around every single corner, pizza shop on pizza shop. Uh, but, but that's really the only change that's occurred. Um, but you know, everyone gives Jersey a hard time, but it's not that bad. It's just another state. <laughs> but but just pizza compared to the you know mm. the Connecticut pizza capital. I mean, you I, I know you're you're closer to Hartford than you were New Haven, but like you're you're right there, and like people love their Connecticut pizza. Yeah, I mean, people do. I'm not really a pizza snob. Uh, you know, to me, a good slice is a good slice. I I love New Haven style. I love. Jersey style, I guess. I don't even know if it has a name. Uh, so it is what it is. I'm not, you know, as long as it's like hot and pretty good, I'm, I'm fine with it.
Good. Yeah, there we go. We'll finish on that note. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Ronan, we appreciate the time, man. G good luck the rest of the way, and uh, we'll be watching. Sounds good. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, no problem, Ronan. Thanks, man. All right, see ya. So, Beth Hewitt does join us now. Beth, we appreciate you coming on after a big win over Notre Dame there for Vandermilt. I mean, how exciting was it to get another ranked win for you guys? Um, I think that's like the third in the last four seasons now. Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, we've played Notre Dame a fair amount and um, been on been on the wrong side of it uh, pretty badly a, a couple times. So, you know, to go up against an opponent like that, that we really respect and um, Chris Halfpenny, you know, obviously she's a great coach. They always just have um, such a good squad. So to to be able to get the win um, specifically on our home field was pretty, pretty awesome. And you guys are building off what was a really successful year. You make the NCAA tournament for the first time in your tenure there in Vanderbilt. It had been a while for the program. How does this win just kind of build on the momentum that you guys probably feel like you built off of last year? Yeah, I think that's really the key is, you know, you come off of this season and it had been 10 years since we made NCAAs. Everybody's feeling so great. And then, you know, you lose a pretty big senior class and kind of, feel like you're restarting a little bit, right? Each season is a, is a fresh start. So, um, you know, you think you have the pieces, you think you've recruited the new kids that are going to help fill some of those spots, but until you're, you know, on the field, uh, day one of the season, you really still have some question marks, right? So I think what's nice about this group is we just have a, a deep squad this year and whether it's a, a fifth year senior or a freshman doing it, it seems like you know, somebody else steps up each day, whether it's in a game or in practice. Yeah, we were mentioning it before we started here. I mean, you were down 4 nothing in Notre Dame. What did it tell you about this group specifically to be like, okay, we got this. Let's keep going. Yeah, I called the timeout. I think we were down 3 to nothing, And I always am interested, again, first time you're in, in, in a situation like that where we're down by four. And um, you, you want to see how a team's going to respond, right? And everybody was super calm in the huddle. Um, just kind of figuring out some of the pieces. And I think we just had a little bit of the jitters going up as we got started and, um, you know, came together. And that, that was one of my messages is when, when things go bad, when things go south, it, it lacks as a game of runs, right? It's, you got to weather the storm. And so we just have to make sure that we come together and we figure it out as a unit. Well, you guys had a chance to win that game there in Nashville. And I, I, we were talking about it before. Nashville seems like just such a cool city to, to be in. What's it like lacrosse-wise in Nashville and to be coaching a program that you, you don't have a lot of other programs around you in terms of, especially at the college level? Yeah, it's, it's definitely different. I mean, being a Syracuse native where you're given a lacrosse stick from, you know, the time you can walk, uh, it, it's very different in Nashville. It's it's growing for sure. Um, I would say that the, the guys end of it actually a little bit faster in, in the high schools and, and that sort of thing. But um, you know, we're really trying to get into the to the the youth programs a little bit more and just trying to get more girls playing. Right. But, um, you know, I think people are really excited. Our, our athletic trainer told us she was at the women's basketball game on Sunday and she had a lacrosse sweatshirt on and a bunch of the fans were stopping her like, man, you guys beat Notre Dame. That's so awesome. And I mean, you just that doesn't happen typically. So um, I think it was just great for for the girls to to really feel like they had accomplished something great. and. We just want to keep building on it. How unique has this experience at Vanderbilt been? You know, in terms of your career, your path is fascinating, Beth. I mean, you go out and to Oregon, you help launch a program. You're at Lemoyne and you deal with the, the re, you don't deal with, but work with the reclassification there. And now you've been with Vanderbilt in this, like you said, this emerging environment of lacrosse. Now, how unique has this been, this experience compared to those other ones? It's interesting. It's, it's, it's been kind of this, new start each place I've gone, you know, obviously Oregon from, from the ground up and um, Lemoyne, I wasn't expecting uh, to be reclassified when I took the position, but um, it's also exciting. You know, it's, I, I love a good challenge. I love um, figuring out what's going to work and what's not. And, um, you know, being here at Vanderbilt and, you know, I have a lot of people who say, oh man, that's such a hard place to win because it's such a challenging school. And it totally is. But to me, that's exciting. And, you know, I think um, we have some really awesome student athletes who understand what it means to win now. And, um, you know, I'm just I'm just excited to be able to lead them because it's they're a really inspiring group.
But I also have to think, because you're right, Vanderbilt is a tremendous school, but I also have to think, like, you bring somebody to Nashville and it's an SEC institution with big athletic programs and facilities, and it's like, oh, wait, there's also another side and there's some other intrigue in terms of recruiting. Like, what's, that, what's the recruiting pitch like when you uh, get to a prospective student athlete? Well, I will tell you, typically when their parents get here, uh, we're their number one choice. They're like, they want to come visit Nashville every weekend, that's for sure. So the, the parents are always uh, the ones who are the most sad if anyone tells us no. But yeah, I would say the, the combination of um, the school, uh, you know, the program, the, our team, I mean, people meet our team and, and the personality is contagious. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people say that, but it's just a really unique group. Um, and then the city, I mean, there's a stat that there's, you know, a million people a day moving here. And I, I will tell you from the construction cranes, uh, it looks like it and the amount of condos, but it's just a very unique um, combination because a lot of your bigger SEC schools are in more rural areas. And so we definitely draw to a different crowd and, um, you know, we're even flight, flight wise, we're, you know, an hour flight from the majority of um a lot of the teams were playing. So it's travel a little bit different. We don't go on buses very often, but um, quick flights to the Northeast and um, we get the kids back to, to get to class. Yeah, uh, that's that's a good way to put it, you know, for in terms of getting some people to come. It, it's a, yeah. You've worked on that, which I imagine over the years. And it, <laughs> so far, so what is the next step, I, I guess, in, in terms of the, like talk about the win for, over Notre Dame and the NCAA tournament last year, what's do you envision being the next step for you guys? Well, I'd say the next step right now is, you know, specifically this week coming out and really working after a win like that, you know, and I said, we want to be the team that builds on this versus acting like we've arrived. Right. And I think um, it, it's exciting and it's important to celebrate wins like that. And, and I'm sure they did on Saturday, that's for sure. But, um, you know, progressing forward, we just want to keep taking steps forward. And, you know, I, I said to them at the beginning of the year, we know that our end result is to, to one day be competing for a national championship. But last year's step of getting to the NCAAs was amazing. And it was a huge one, but we didn't win. And so the next one is, is getting that win in NCAAs and progressing forward and giving ourselves a chance. And, you know, the experience that this team got from going through, you know, I mean, we didn't find out till the last hour that we were in. So it, it wasn't one of those situations where we were kicking back, waiting to see who we were playing. We had fingers crossed and um, holding our breath, but um, it was really, really awesome for this group. And, you know, just excited to, to really keep trying to build on that momentum. Well, and I have to think it's a, it can be a dose of reality too, when you look up and the, I mean, you guys are fighting in the conference with Florida every year, who has been the class of not only the conference, but a team that's top 10 nationally. It has to be a, a bit of a, okay, well, we still know we've got the Gators that we've got to track down. Absolutely. And uh, our ongoing joke last year, Mandy, Leary, and I were, um, Gainesville basically became our second home because we played so many games there between our home game AACs were hosted there. We get we get sent there for NCAA's. So we got there as like our, our home court. But now that the Gators are obviously the class of the league right now, and that's who everybody's chasing. So um, really respect them. Um, they they have such a great group and so athletic, um, and always always will be. So we we feel like we can compete with everybody right now. But you know we got to go out and prove it. And you got a, a challenge here in the next couple of weeks. You got Elon coming up on Friday, and then you go out west for Colorado and Denver. So a lot on the horizon, too. I mean, it's it's February, but we're getting there, right? We're getting in the middle of the season, which is good, of course, in this day and age when things were a little up in the air in the la last couple of years. I'm sure being normal has helped you guys, too. I Just feeling like we're actually in a normal lacrosse season where, you know, for us in our league last year, we played every team twice in the same weekend, which was very different. And I wouldn't say that anybody uh, would like to play that schedule again. So we're just, we're happy to be playing some of these non-conference teams and, and seeing some new faces this year. And um, yeah, just excited to, to see our fans too, you know, be able to see the parents on the road and, and things like that, because we all know lacrosse um, it is a huge family and it, there's a lot of a lot of relationships through the sport and that was really the unfortunate part of last year with COVID and not being able to really inter you know, mingle with 
with some of the people you really know and love. So I'm excited to get back to that too. You're in Nashville. Do you like country music? Love country music. Okay. You have to. Yeah. So have you met it? Have you had any cool country mu music experiences like seeing somebody in a small venue or anything? Um, yes. Well, we've had a couple come to our games. Wow. Which are pretty cool. So Billy Carrington came to one of our games, but um, you run into people all over the place. I mean, grocery store, restaurants. I was sitting uh, at a restaurant next to Little Big Town and wow. everybody just sits and no one says anything to them because they're like, no, that's the Nashville thing. Like, you have to be cool. You can't mm, can't interrupt yeah. them while they're eating. So, But little did they know they were sitting next to Beth Hewitt. So right. it goes both ways. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I think I heard them say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, all right. Uh, Beth, we appreciate the time. Um, good luck at these next couple of games. Congratulations on the nice win over Notre Dame. But I'll uh, be watching you guys uh, from here, too. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, Vandy, a team to watch. They've got an interesting couple of weeks here. They got Elon this weekend, a game we're going to pick here in a second. Yep. And then a uh, trip out west, Denver and Colorado in the same little weekend thing. So keep an eye on Vanderbilt. Good story. Vandy. Very good story. I love, love that. And, that's, and, good, and I uh, want to go to Nashville. Yeah, Beth is trying to get us there. Let's, let's make, I think we should make that happen. All right, anyway, let's make some picks. quick picks happen here. Travis, you begin here. We're going all women, Ohio State, Denver. Yeah, I got the Pioneers, 12 to 8. Uh, Bea Barons has a hat trick in all three games so far That's in this 3-0 and start. Denver with 15-plus goals in two of those three games. The only one was the Stanford victory, which is a really good gutted-out type win, 8-6. to uh, This is the biggest test. So far for 3-0 and Ohio State. I just like Denver a little bit more. Okay. Um, I'm going to Vanderbilt, Elon. This is a noon Friday game, I believe. 15-9, to Vandy is my pick here. I, I think I, I we just talked to Beth, and you could kind of hear it in her voice, um, how she feels about this team. Paige Gunning, the goalie, 11 saves against Notre Dame. Coming up in a big spot. Gabby Fornia, we talked about her. Four goals, eight assists. She had... A big day against Notre Dame as well. And don't forget, she's the preseason American attacker of the year. Yeah. And that's in a conference with Florida, who has, this seems like a yearly basis, all these all this talent coming out. So, Vandy, don't mess with them. Elon trying to maybe figure out their offense a little bit. May McGlynn moving on after um, last year graduating. And they also lost their goalie, Paulina DeFata. She went to Pitt in a grad year as well. Just let's keep an eye out for Jillian Curran, cousin okay. of Ryan Archer Diacono. You oh. might know him from Villanova fame. Is his brother and her cousin also is there right now. Right. But um, she leads the scoring for Elon. I just think Vandy's going to be a little bit too much at this point of the season. So uh, I got Vandy 15 to 9. All right. Speaking of the AAC, Florida, big test. They go on the road to College Park to take on Maryland. But I am firmly, firmly on the Terps bandwagon. Like, let's okay. keep it rolling. I got uh, Maryland 15 to 11. 11. Aurora, accordingly, the transfer from Hopkins has been terrific. As good as advertised, averaging five and a half points per game. They scored 20 goals in the opener against St. Joe's, 17 more against Virginia in their biggest win of the season. I think they keep it rolling here, though. Keep an eye on the freshman for Florida, Emma Lopinto, who's yeah. really highly regarded recruit coming in. She yeah. has been terrific. Five points per game so far in the first couple of games of her college career, including against North Carolina last week. So Florida has been tested here early, but I don't know if they can get the win on the road. Okay, we'll go to High Point, James Madison, 12 p.m. Saturday. I am, once again, almost running it back because this is what happened last year between these two. JMU beat High Point in overtime. I got JMU winning a close one again, 11-10 to 10 over High Point. High Point with a couple of losses this year at Davidson against Duke as well. They were the Big South champs a year ago. Abby Hormis, the grad student, four points in each of her first two games. She does well to draw. She gets those ground balls as well. But I think JMU, and of course I did their game in North Carolina, I think that game might have thrown them a little off kilter for their next couple. Yeah. But, you know, with Virginia Tech, they struggled a bit. And in the beginning of the game against UConn, they also went down, I think, 3 nothing early on. So I think maybe the North Carolina game sort of – you got a game plan for that game, probably has it on your mind for so long. And North Carolina is such a unique team in that they're so great on so many levels. It might mess you up everything else. And they have to sort of settle into their season. That's what they did in the second half against UConn. I see them doing that more moving forward. Isabella Pearson is doing what she's done uh, from her start of her career last year and doing that even more six goals against UConn and Molly Doggerty has been good since the day one so I think JMU they're going to start to get themselves into a rhythm here and they know that they need to to be able to get themselves into the tournament this year
All right, uh, I got Hopkins and Penn. We got a little Big Ten Ivy League matchup. I've got the Quakers 12 to 10 in this one. Hopkins trying to respond after a tough loss against Loyola. The Greyhounds uh, off to a terrific start here to this season. This is really the first test in two games for Penn. But they've got a couple of sophomores. We went into the season unsure. they kind of unproven because they had some different pieces coming in. A couple of sophomores leading the way with three goals in the op opener in Caitlin Kaminsky and Allison Feely. Keep an eye on both of them, the two leading scorers after game one. Yeah, it's been a tough schedule for Johns Hopkins to start the year. They've had a lot of battles. And, yeah. And they'll figure it out as time yeah, goes. Sure. They get to the Big Ten schedule. Okay, um, I now have my next game stalling for dramatic effect temple at princeton is that right yes i think that's right temple at princeton 12 p.m saturday i've got princeton winning 13 to 11 though i think this is like you see there i think it's gonna be a little closer than you might assume princeton i really liked how they looked against virginia 17 to 11 big win in their first game in two years marge donovan scored the first goal of his her, her career excuse me and Princeton did this kind of going away without Kyla Sears or Donovan for a lot of the second half. Donovan was working through some cramp issues. Kyla Sears was disqualified after two yellow cards. And those are basically their two cornerstones <laughs> yeah. heading into this year. What a welcome back, Kyla. I mean, <laughs> she was ready to go. But um, so, yeah, Princeton, I think we saw a lot out of them. And, and Temple, meanwhile, 3-0 wins over Nar Army, Nova, and St. Joe's. Last year, NCAA second round team lost to Boston College. Quinn Nicoli, seven goals against St. Joe. She's puts on some points on the board this year as well. They've got a good goalie in Annie Carroll as well. 52% saves, 7.2 goals against average. So I see them competing a bit here with Princeton. As Princeton's second game back, obviously they're continuing to um, – but get back into the swing yeah. of things, I guess, for lack of a better term. And, and Temple, a competitive team at that, and maybe a little bit underrated under the radar, too. So it's going to be a close game. Okay. Uh, ACC showdown Saturday evening, 6 p.m. Eastern. Syracuse goes out to Notre Dame, take on the Irish. I think this is a good game. Notre Dame giving Northwestern a, a tight game, a one-goal game earlier this week. But I still have the orange, 15-13 Despite the fact that Notre Dame's desperate, they've lost three in a row now going back to the loss to Michigan early in the year. But the Orange has just been too much. Megan Tyrell is on fire yeah. to start the season. She's seventh in the country in points, more than six points per game so far. And uh, the one thing to keep an eye on, and this is why I think this is going to be a little bit more high scoring, Syracuse still got to figure out the goalie situation. They continue to go back and forth. Neither, but neither goalie has stepped forward and, and I, th I have to imagine that's what Kayla Trainer's is waiting for, somebody to step in there for one of these halves and really shut it down and give her a little bit of leeway. So opportunity for uh, both goalies. All right, let's go 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. So maybe right after a brunch or church, if you will, yeah. you can go watch Stanford at Virginia. This should be another, I know I've called a lot of close games here, but I like Virginia by one at Ooh. this point. I think that Stanford. It's been a tough run. You know, they've played a lot of tough teams at Syracuse. You lose by three. Then you have to play Albany, and you win that game kind of controversially. Then you have Denver as well, and you lose a uh, gritty game at that, eight to six. But you also have to keep in mind they're young, and we talked about this before. But also, they're going to get better and better as the year goes on. So yeah. they're going to continue to compete because I think they're a hungry team. Ashley Humphrey, the redshirt freshman, five goals. Annabelle Frist, true freshman. She's got 10 goals, two assists, 12 draw controls. And th their goal is good, too. The junior, Kara Raheim, has 12 saves against Syracuse, 11 against Denver. So they have all the pieces, and it's just going to take them some time to sort of figure it out together. And yeah. I, they're going to be one of the teams, I think, at the end of the year that you're saying, wow, this doesn't look like the same team because they're starting to dominate at times. And meanwhile, you got Virginia, who just went through the gauntlet of all gauntlets. You play Maryland, Princeton, and Boston College all within like a seven-day period. <laughs> yeah. Of course you're going to lose those games. I'm sorry. So, That's hard. I mean, really hard. But they, were, they felt like they were in all of those games at, at one point or another. So I don't think they have too much to hang their heads about. That's why I think they'll be just a little bit better than Stanford because they're so battle-tested. Yeah. No, all right. For sure. Uh, finally, Jacksonville UNC for me. I mean, I, I can't go against the Tar Heels here. They're just too good. Jacksonville's a, a talented team. They had a tough loss against USC a couple of weeks ago. But North Carolina's too much. I got them 15-7. to seven. Caitlin Warsberger and Jamie Ortega both have more than 15 points through three games. Yeah. Nobody's been within four goals of North Carolina. I think that trend continues. I'm pretty sure that was one of the things last year we talked about. Would anyone come within four goals of North Carolina that was all year long? We posed, I, <laughs> I believe, remember that was a conversation year. piece. And look at it. It's 2022. We're talking about the same, same thing. thing. Finally, we've got...
got Michigan Towson. We just talked about Towson earlier in the show. It was our yeah. midweek moment against Loyola. And I like Michigan, 15 to 11. Caitlin Muir, 13 points. Caitlin Mead has six goals, 12 draw controls. Um, she hasn't scored since Notre Dame. She had four goals in that game as well. Towson coming off a couple of losses. I still think they're kind of young and working through some things. And Michigan, I kind of like their what their mojo is right now. Hannah Nielsen, I think she's... You know, I guess I don't know if they've settled in, but now you've, you've worked through the recruiting class. You're, you're going to sort of settling into who you are as a program over time and the kind of athletes you get and, and proving a lot of people, I think, may be wrong after a, a tough year last year. And now they, they, they're coming out with uh, a more of an energy this year, which I've liked a lot. So I've got Michigan winning this one over Towson. And if you want to hear more from Hannah Nielsen, you can listen back. We had her on the show last week. So just head back into the archives there and uh, take a listen to that interview. She was terrific. Do that. As always uh let's turn our attention now to our games to Ooh. watch this weekend these are the games that for us are can't miss we've got circled for one reason or the other what's your game that you have to be watching this week i'm going to be watching the princeton and maryland men play because i'm intrigued by princeton with that great recruiting class they brought in they've had a couple of nice performances to start their year and see what they can do against maryland i'm really intrigued to see exactly what happens here so Princeton, Maryland, I mean, Maryland men, obviously, you're, you're, you're getting treated yeah. every time you watch them. So I, I think this game could be an intrigue and to see where it goes is what I'm looking for. I think overshadowed in all the Michael Salvers talk back in 2020 was the fact that he had a very talented supporting cast around him. Yeah. Now, obviously, you take that guy out and it's a year and a half later, but still a lot of talent on this roster. And I think this is an opportunity to see just how talented are they yeah. without uh, a Michael Sowers piece in the middle. Didn't realize this was on Big Ten Plus, though. We'll have to work to get um, get to figure out how to watch that. Get in there. The, the login. Somebody, <laughs> who's got login Who's got a login? <laughs> I am uh, going to go with the game you can watch, uh, I believe, on ESPN Plus, Patriot League game. UMass takes that quick trip. Across the Mass Pike, it's actually not that quick, and it's going to be through some <laughs> snowstorms. But on Saturday, UMass makes that trip to BU to Nickerson Field, 1 o'clock Saturday afternoon. BU is 2-0. They come off the win over Bryant. Nice little upset win for the Terriers over a team that was uh, there in the, the bottom part of the top 20 conversation, which is why I'm so intrigued by this, because I have kind of quiet high expectations for UMass like just internally I'm starting I'm I get the feeling that this UMass team could be good mm. because you have both the Tobin brothers back and they're terrific Chris Conley who was missing for the second part of that season last year I think was a bigger piece to miss for UMass than some people realize he's the quarterback and has been the guy over the last couple of years that's made this offense go Gabriel Prosik is still there as a terrific Canadian finisher and Matt Noten goal is still I think going to be, by the end of his career, a guy who's going to be in All-American conversations across the country because I do think he is that good. So the battle for Massachusetts is what I've got my eye on on Saturday. I appreciate your internal like conflict you've had, your internal expectations. I'm, and now quietly, voicing, I'm, and now voicing I'm quietly optimistic. Like I look at the roster and I go, from knowing and the number of UMass games I've done in the past, I look at the roster and I go, they've got a bunch of talent back. Like I think they just need to mm. prove it to some other people and to themselves, like we can compete with some of the better teams in the country. I think this is a nice step in the right direction. Played Army tough, and so can they beat BU and, and continue to try to get rolling? They got Yale on the road in a couple of weeks. We'll yeah. learn more about right, that. Yeah. I mean, for her saying you're being quiet about it, being pretty loud right now. Well, I'm just, <laughs> I've think, got my eye on it's, it's out in the open now. I'm interested to <laughs> not, see. It's not quiet anymore. Not, it's a game guess, you're watching. Guess you're right. Uh, let's, go to the, <laughs> let's go to the NLL. What game are you watching in the NLL this, week, NLL this weekend? Uh, I like Halifax and Philadelphia. The two of them played uh, just a couple of weeks ago, back the day before Valentine's Day. That it was actually Super Bowl Sunday, February 13th, so you may have missed it. But it was a terrific game, a 10-8 game. It was a one-goal game going into the fourth, 6-5 to five Halifax led. They then uh, scored four goals uh, in the final frame to go ahead and win. Zach Higgins, the Philadelphia goalie, made 44 saves. And to, to tell you how much confidence they have in Zach Higgins, they traded Eric Penny earlier this week. Uh, to Saskatchewan, their backup goalie. So they are, Wings are all in on Higgins as their starter. And uh, the Wings just played tight games this year. They're at 500. They've got a bunch of one or two goal games, whether they've won or lost, usually entertaining. And so I, I like this game for that reason. Obviously, Halifax is 
been super fun to watch. Cody Jamison is off to a, a terrific start here to the season. I guess the middle will, toward the back end of the year. He's really kind of found his groove. He had a nice game in the win over Philadelphia a couple weeks ago. So I'll, I got my eye on this one. And he's got hot takes on Twitter. Cody Jameson. Paul, Paul, Gate, Paul Gate, greatest the goat. greatest look. That's a for a, that's for a different show at a different <laughs> time, but uh Coach Jammer, I love it. He gets stirring things up, stirring the pot. He was a 22, so I guess he can say <laughs> he, it. He can. He has the rights to say whatever he, he ball true. pleases. Um I am going with the rock at the riptide. And the reason I'm gonna do this is because I want to see Tom Shriver and Jeff T. Uh Shriver's been on one, as they say. He's been incredible the last yep. couple games, and it's his birthday today. So happy birthday, Tom. Um, and, and Jeff T has been electric and he's been everything that we've hoped for and more. So I just want to see those two. Sometimes you just tune in to see a couple guys play and that's what I'm doing. You're a big Tom guy, huh? Oh, you know, that's, that's how we roll out here. We roll deep. Tom, Me, Tom Schreiber, they stick DB12, you know, the whole, the whole crew. Tom, I, Thomas McNeely really has provided these graphics for you in the I show. I really didn't think you were a big Tom Brady fan. I just said that. I mean, we so. have the same name. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so that I'm a fan of Tom his, Eschen his is name. a Tom Brady fan, yeah. a Tom Schreiber fan, and our graphics guy, Thomas McNeely, is a fan of him too. Mm. And uh, uh, we are a fan of you. We appreciate you taking some time to listen to or watch this week's show. We'll be right back here on Tuesday. Mm. But for now, for Tom and Travis, we'll see you later.